Excellent. Good morning, everybody. My name is Apurva Jadhav. I'm a senior demographer at the uh, Office of Population and Reproductive Health at USAID, and I have the privilege of moderating this fireside chat today. I'd like to welcome everybody, those in person as well as those online, and uh, I'd especially like to thank our census colleagues, uh, many of whom are coming in to USAID um, for the first time today in person. So welcome. Um, we would be remiss if we did not acknowledge that we're sitting together here on Leap Day. And so did you know that one out of every 4,061 people are born on Leap Day? Probability. So there's about 5 million people alive today that were born on Leap Day, including one who's here today. <laughs> and we wouldn't, this is probably an undercount, but we wouldn't even know an estimate if it weren't for accurate census and civil registration data. So, <laughs> So it can't be a better day to speak about our remarkable partnership, so welcome. And it's been such a coup in getting both of you together. Um, I'd love to introduce you all to the audience for a second. Dr. Atul Gawande is the Assistant Administrator for Global Health at the U.S. Agency for International Development, where he leads our agency's efforts to improve lives everywhere, from preventing child and maternal deaths, to controlling the HIV AIDS epidemic, to combating infectious diseases and preparing for future outbreaks. Census data is vital for all of it. Prior to joining the Biden-Harris administration, Dr. Gawande was a practicing surgeon at Brigham and Women's Hospital and a professor at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. He was the founder of Ariadne Labs, a joint center for health systems innovations and of Lifebox, a nonprofit making surgery safer globally. In addition, he has served as a longtime staff writer for the New Yorker magazine and has written four New York Times best-selling books, Complications, Better, The Checklist Manifesto, and Being Mortal. Robert L. Santos is the 26th director of the U.S. Census Bureau. His career spans more than 40 years in survey research, statistical design and analysis, and executive level management. Director Santos has held leadership positions at the nation's top survey research organizations, including the University of Chicago's National Opinion Research Center, where he served as Vice President of Statistics and Methodology and Director of Survey Operations, and the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research as the Director of Survey Operations. He has spent the second half of his career as Chief Methodologist and Vice President of the Urban Institute, where he conducted policy research across a wide range of areas. Director Santos has also me. Director Santos has also held positions such as the President of the American Statistical Association as well as the American Association for Public Opinion Research. You see? What a coup. Um, <laughs> to get us started, I'd like to briefly introduce Shaimi De Silva, who is the Office Director for our Office of Population and Reproductive Health, under which our lovely partnership uh, or interagency agreement between the Census Bureau and USAID sits. So with that, Shaimi. Good morning, and thank you for joining us both in person and virtually. I'm just going to take a few minutes before we get to the main event um, to, to talk a little bit about the interagency agreement. So um, first, thanks to Assistant Administrator Gawande and Director Santos for taking time to be with us this morning. I wanted to just touch on a few minutes on the history of the relationship between our two agencies and the evolution of the work that we do together. Apoorva mentioned an interagency agreement, or an IAA, as we call it. Uh, well, a fun fact is that the, this agreement actually predates the very existence of USAID. It was originally signed in 1954, 70 years ago, between the Department of Commerce, which was the home of the census, and the Foreign Operations Administration, which is one of the predecessor agencies to USAID. So not only is this partnership longstanding, but the nature of the work performed under it really reflects how development assistance um, has evolved over the decades. Uh, in the 1970s, our focus at USAID was, at the time, was kind of meeting basic ne human needs. And the work performed under the IAA uh, supported that by addressing issues like population growth and population dynamics. 
In the 1990s, after the historic International Conference on Population and Development, USAID continued our shift from a purely demographic approach to population programming to a more rights-based approach that centers individual choice and autonomy in our health and development programs. So a, a similar shift occurred within the IAA to focus more on partnering with countries to meet their own development data needs and to really enshrine the idea of equity, particularly with respect to data. So through this IAA, USAID has funded the Census Bureau's International Program Center to provide technical assistance to meet the census needs of countries ar around the world. And I just want to highlight a few of the accomplishments from this long partnership. In just the last decade, USAID supported the Census Bureau to train government officials from over 120 countries in various aspects of census taking. The public domain software developed through our partnership has brought innovation and enhanced data quality to census operations across the globe. And in this recent 2020 census round, over 800 million individuals were enumerated with the Census and Survey Processing Software, or CS Pro, uh, as we know it, uh, funded through the IAA. So we're so proud of these accomplishments. And looking forward, we are continuing to reimagine this partnership for the next decade with the recognition that census data are really critical across a range of development areas. So in this next phase, we're going to continue to work together on strengthening and modernizing national statistical systems to improve country data and broaden this partnership to other offices in the Global Health Bureau and, and with the UN Population Fund. Through the IAA, um, we'll produce data and analyses on the intersection of climate and population dynamics and improve geospatial modeling of vulnerable populations in partnership with the USAID's Geo Center. So we're very excited to embark on this next phase of our partnership and to pursue these critical new areas that will both support our global health and development goals and continue to meet the data needs of our partner countries. So I want to thank the team at the Census Bureau and our team in the Office of Population and Reproductive Health for all the work you have done together and will do in the next phase. Thank you all so much for being here, and over to you both. Excellent. Well, thank you for, the, for that. Time. <laughs> and Director Santos, Rob, thank you for coming to mm -hmm. us at USAID and for this longstanding partnership. Um, I've been really looking forward to the conversation, in part because of just getting the chance to get to talk to you a little bit about you um, oh, thank you. as well. <laughs> uh, and you know, I think of careers as um, either developing along the lines of, of a focus on an expertise or a skill, or trying to drive an impact, whatever skills that's mm -hmm. required for you. And um, uh, we're a, a place defined by an impact that we're trying to drive. And so we have a variety of different skills, including statisticians, demographers, and others that participate. You've built your career as a statistician and, 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 and entered leadership in demography. Mm -hmm. um, how did this happen? <laughs> What's the <laughs> pathway? You know, uh, parents don't often say, you know, I hope you grow up to be a statistician. <laughs> <laughs> or a director of a census bureau, for that matter. So <laughs> tell us about that career and, and uh, how you came to it and, and uh, how it, what that's brought you to focus on it. Uh, well, yeah, thank you for uh, such a lovely question to start at the morning. Um, I'm, it's First of all, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to have this fireside chat. And welcome to everybody. Uh, I really appreciate, and we at the Census Bureau really appreciate our partnership and look forward to the next 70 years. <laughs> um, me personally, I had a, a really interesting road uh, navigating from growing up in the barrios in San Antonio. I'm Mexican-American, uh, first Latino director of the US Census Bureau, although I wish I wasn't. Uh, and uh, I came up uh, actually with a really strong love of mathematics. And uh, interestingly enough, back in those days, I ended up graduating from, uh, from the university in 76. Uh, so I'm a viejito, as we call ourselves. <laughs> uh, we, uh, there were, weren't a lot of jobs for people with PhD in mathematics. It wasn't the, the great thing that it is now. And uh, so I was led over into statistics. 
And so I went to University of Michigan and learned survey sampling at the Institute for Social Research uh, and uh, started delving into that mathematical statistics survey area. But it's really interesting. Over the life course of being a Latino growing up in a Latino neighborhood uh, in San Antonio, you get an instilled in you sort of culture and values and life experiences. And this one value th uh, that really resonated with me, stuck with me, and combined with my love for statistics to uh, make me the person that I am. And that value is helping people. So uh, I like to survey research because it, you know, mathematics are great. I could do all the proofs and all that stuff. But when it came to actually helping people, which resonated with me, I knew that we could gather health you know, survey data or survey data on unemployment or other types of, um, of social phenomenon for which we know that there are disparities and underserved communities and we need to you know, generate help. Uh, so that stuck with me. I ended up elevating to leadership positions, but I always, always drove with me this notion of both helping people and statistics. Uh, I embed that in my uh, leadership style. And I noticed uh, uh, a little bit into my career that often I was the sole person of color in a room full of decision makers. And I found that I ultimately had a unique voice if, if I brought my culture, my values, my life experiences, and combined them with my technical training and my love for helping people. And uh, that's, I suspect, what got me noticed and uh, got me into different leadership positions. As a leader, when I see opportunities to work for the Census Bureau to work with USAID, that, that just resonates in terms of not only are we helping ourselves uh, through living our values of, of providing good data, but we are helping people around the, the world because we live in a global society, right? So that's pretty much my story. I think I'll stop there because I could, you know, I don't want to take too much time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope we more of it comes up as we, as we uh, discuss this work. So, you know, your career um, focused a lot on, uh, of course, domestic uh, mm -hmm. focus, and the census is a domestic um, focused agency. And I didn't realize it's international mm -hmm. um, uh, components as well. And until I was really briefed on uh, the IAA, our interagency agreement, didn't fully understand what we were partnering to do in enabling systems in other countries for, for a census. So to go to your first question of, the, of helping people, what does lack of a census do that hurts people in other countries? And what are the indicators that we can have about uh, achieving impact in ways that help people from supporting the development of census capacities? Uh, well, again, thank you for that question. You know, we're really proud of our uh, international programs center at the Census Bureau. Uh, we have, you know, dozens of technical staff who work with USAID to, to get out into the world and work with countries to bolster their national statistical offices uh, and create that infrastructure. But what would a world or what would a country be without uh, some type of count or enumeration of knowing who its population is? Um, it's, uh, it's, a really, it's a real loss of opportunity to not understand who you are as a nation, as a country, which is something we, we very much value uh, at the Census Bureau in terms of being able to generate the data that paint the portrait of, uh, of our nation, that show the diversity of our nation, that can be used to, to identify populations that are underserved and that deserve better, more attention, and celebrate the, the wonderful things that are, are accomplishing both in our economy as well as in our, our population. Those are the opportunities that are missed uh, if there is insufficient data in a country uh, to, in order to, to make those types of assessments, to, make, to have that basic understanding. 
And so that's why we are incredibly proud and, um, and driven to, to work with USAID and the countries that you serve to, um, to see that we can bolster those statistical offices so that they can in, uh, realize the, the, the potential because you can't realize potential without understanding who you are and, and the data behind it. I feel like I wrestle with these issues not infrequently. Mm -hmm. um, we currently are managing, uh, for example, with a rise in MPOX um, in, uh, the, in Democratic Republic of Congo right now. We know how many, we have a count of children who've died in the, in the northern provinces, the, with those counts have risen, but we don't have a good understanding of the denominator. And so we can't tell whether this is a massively high uh, mortality rate, which would imply a skin-to-skin -skin transmission of a smallpox-like illness that's killing, you know, one set of numbers comes out saying this is 9 or 10 percent of the, of the kids being affected, which is very high. And then others that suggest it's more like 1 or 2 percent, which is where MPOX has traditionally been. And we, uh, we, without the demographics, we're in a complete blind spot and we've been scrambling for weeks to try to figure out now how do you backfill this information? How do you get this information? Well, the, the interesting thing on that is that it's nice to the, have the denominator, but the denominator is necessarily dynamic. And so once you conduct a census, you don't declare victory and walk away. That is a starting point then uh, between then and the next census of creating annual population estimates because that's what ends up being in the denominators uh, and then knowing subgroups from that, both geographic as well as demographic subgroups. Do you have particular examples of, um, or an example or a favorite um, uh, uh, a thing that you're particularly proud of that we've accomplished through the interagency agreement where we've been able to build capacity? Uh, yes, we, uh, we have worked with uh, uh, Kenya to, uh, to bolster their statistical uh, agency and provided training for their uh, director general uh, of the National Statistical Office. Um, what was really nice about that relationship is not only did we help them with their censuses and surveys and provide our uh, statistical tool, uh, that, that uh, survey and census processing system, uh, to facilitate uh, taking the censuses and the surveys, but they then grew and, um, and blossomed in their relationship and their knowledge base on how to be a good statistical system and now are helping others. They are paying it forward. So we're really proud of not only being able to go in and basically help enable, but also to build leadership so that then folks can help each other. Yeah, they become, I guess, a, a regional technical source of assistance yes. more widely in, the, in, the, in that area. That's, that and that great. resonates with me uh, in terms of helping people, right? <laughs> Why, you know, I was in Nigeria, for example, where there hasn't been a census in 25 plus years. And um, what are the reasons why uh, such a large country or any country would not be sustaining their census operations? Uh, there, there are many, many reasons. Some could be political, <laughs> obviously. Um, but also there's a lack of knowledge sometimes that um, Folks recognize that there's a need, but don't yet necessarily have the resources or the knowledge to make it happen, uh, which is why it is so important for, for us to have our relationship with USAID, because we have the, the individuals that, with the technical skills who can go in country and work directly with the statistical offices and individuals to bolster that, that capacity and get them going. Yeah, I was struck, I mean, the political is not a small matter, right? We've Absolutely. seen in the yeah. United States how um, it can mean a loss, of, a loss of congressional seats, it can be a rise in congressional seats. India, I was really surprised to learn, um, uh, has had you know, strong uh, um, national census, but there had been uh, such political uh, concern about it that 
they no longer allocate political seats. They're based on current census updates, that they're still stuck to a, a 1970s uh, census as the basis for distribution of power. <laughs> um, and uh, now, I, someone might correct me on that, but at least that's what um, I, I heard about. So please correct me if I'm wrong on, on uh, getting that right. Um, the, uh, what do you think are the primary lessons we're learning about what's required to strengthen um, international health, international census uh, capacity? Um, well, first of all, I'd say that our wonderful staff in the International Program Center would be, have much, a much better knowledge base upon which to report. Yeah, we're um, both sitting up here with, with, <laughs> we're with a, a fraction of what some of our teams are learning every, every day. Right. Uh, so uh, I, in, in terms of, uh, uh, actually, I, f I, forgot the, I forgot the question. What we're learning about how to strengthen international census capacity. Oh, OK. So well, uh, I would imagine that what we're, what we're learning is that folks are eager for the knowledge. Uh, and if we can find a way to get the, uh, that knowledge base, the training, the webinars, the in-person engagement, and show folks firsthand how to, how to conduct surveys, how to process data, tabulate, and provide it, that uh, th that is incredibly important. Uh, also demonstrating the value, uh, just in terms of data equity, of not simply counting people, but uh, gathering information about their demographic and social characteristics. So uh, in some countries, we've gone through and said, yes, it's enough to do a, a, a dis, uh, some type of census, but let's also gather you know, gender and age and other demographic characteristics so you can get the denominators. You can get those disaggregations where it can really make a difference. And then finally, really looking towards the future, but we've already done some work on this, um, getting to recognize that it's not enough to talk about a whole country, but you need the geospatial data to then do the demarcations of jurisdictions, which then need to be maintained because they're always changing, uh, but then associating the population and housing and economic characteristics within those and uh, it is incredibly important because that's how you then can develop effective public health plans, economic development, uh, business plans, uh, and other and, you know uh, infrastructure uh, building. Yeah, you know, you're starting. Starting, I'm I'm a sucker for <laughs> invisible, incredibly important institutions that you know are permeate our lives and and their power, and you're sitting at that foundation of mm -hmm. something that um, uh, for many of us is basically invisible. At the Global Health Bureau, um, what we see is that we're incredibly driven around evidence. Um, we've set uh, one of our targets, for example, is that in the countries where we work, we should be reducing the percentage of deaths that occur in those countries uh, before the age of 50. Um, our foundations have been in reducing child mortality, and then as child mortality, it's still still much work to be done in that space, but as it's come down, we've recognized that people are getting to live longer, but we have high rates of death in, um, in populations, uh, uh, in much of the populations where we work. It's around 40% will die before the age of 50 versus uh, high-income countries where it's under 10%. Mm -hmm. um, then, uh, so you, you know, you start with, okay, this is where we have to go. What are the diseases? What are the demographics? What's the distribution within countries? We have um, led what I think is one of the, our global flagships, the, the, um, the DHS, the Demographic Health Survey, um, which is now entering its ninth uh, iteration. And, uh, and that has very rich data collected about health status and demographics of, um, of the world where we work. And that gets a, a lot of attention here in the Bureau. We, as countries, have the releases. We use that data to explain to Congress whether we're getting the results we have, to adjust our course. Um, and what I didn't appreciate was that the Demographic Health Survey sits on the foundation of the census data. 
that in order to have a sound demographic health survey, you need the mm -hmm. census data. Otherwise, you have to spend much more money to rebuild those basic components. Um, can you explain that a little bit more than, than my, you know, when, when we want to do demographic or health surveys or those kinds of things, how, what, what is that interconnection? What's the efficiency of having the census system um, occur this massive enterprise that mm -hmm. mobilizes this huge force to go personally count everybody. Why well, is that so essential? Well, it, it, it's essential, uh, first to, of all, to, just to, to, doing, to yeah, doing this work we do. Yeah, it, it's essential, first of all, because you don't want to reinvent the wheel each time you have a research question or a public health question that you want to answer. It's all about infrastructure, data infrastructure. With sufficient data infrastructure, you can create really efficient designs that get at the core of the problem. So if there is a subset of the population, uh, either geographically or demographically, say young women are having a disease of some sort, then having the, the information already in hand about what's the, the prevalence of, of women 20 to 29 year olds uh, in your country or within this region where there is a, a disease that's popping up that's affecting them. That can help uh, build a scientific design and a survey very efficiently rather than basically assuming you don't know anything and going out there and doing a bunch of screening and things of that sort. So it can really be used to leverage efficient and effective designs that hone in on specifically the problem for your particular subpopulation or your region or whatever. Our team, um, you know, has asked me a question I didn't have a good answer to, which is um, how can we use our census data more and more effectively in our health work? One surprise to me as they briefed me before this was, you know, the U.S. Census has a very limited set of data. It's only about as I understand it, about 10 questions. That 10 questions for 10 minutes. <laughs> 10 questions for 10 minutes. That's, that's, you know, um, the, uh, in many of the countries where we work, their census data is much richer, um, 50, 60, 70 questions, and they will sit down with people for an hour mm -hmm. and, and gather information. And that, that data uh, and those data elements, we have accessible to us. But um, uh, I don't quite know what we don't know. <laughs> in order to understand what, what we could be doing with this data. Um, what, what can you say about how we might, um, you know, many of us are in program offices that range from our global health security work to our maternal child health work to um, HIV, TB, malaria. What could we be doing? Um, we lean on that demographic health survey and, and turn to it to ask, you know, we always asking, mm -hmm. can, can you ask more questions? <laughs> on this, well, and they say, if you can pay for it. <laughs> but, um, uh, but I don't think we've dived, dived very deeply into what's available in global census data. How should we think about that? Or what, what surprises you mm -hmm. about what's available more globally than what we're used to seeing in the US? Uh, well, I actually, I'm not terribly knowledgeable about the, the, the breadth of the data that exists globally. Uh, I do know that, that there are similar approaches in, in other countries to the approach that the US and the Census Bureau takes, which is we minimize the amount of information that's needed for a stated purpose, and that is the decennial census, and that's for apportionment purposes. We actually are only looking to get 50 numbers. We get more than that because we ask 10 questions. Um, but beyond that, it is essential for us to gather information about our population, good, high quality information upon which to base policy. And other countries do that too. Our approach is to have uh, something that used to be done for a small fraction of the uh, population, like 5% or so, during the decennial census, we'd ask them another hour's worth of questions. <laughs> And uh, that was called the long form. It was a, it just a subsample, one out of every five or six. And we transitioned that in 2005 to a continuous collection of data that gathers really rich socioeconomic data, you know, uh, poverty status, hunger, 
housing issues, employment, income, etc. It just it goes on and on. It's the rich treasure trove upon which our most of our policy in the U.S. is is done, and it's continuous. So we took something that was available once every ten years and made it so that it's available every year. And then every five years, we scrunch it together so that it's available at really small levels of geography. Uh, I fully expect that other countries are using similar approaches, recognizing that there needs to be a balance between asking people a lot of information once and then waiting for the next census, and instead asking a little bit just what you need for a specific purpose periodically, and then having more continuous deep dives into gathering the socioeconomic data that's going to help them in a variety of areas. Sir, the, um, uh, I think the richness obviously varies from country to country, mm -hmm. but Apoorva um, is a resource for anybody who wants to be able to follow up that I think there is um, you know, exactly the kind of data you're talking about, housing information, um, income information, and so on available that's richer in some countries than others and, uh, and very relevant and, and accessible through this partnership uh, to us. I'd love to talk a little bit about the future of um, the census in, uh, uh, as, as the science and capacities of census has grows. Um, one question I'll start with is how, and if you start to get at it around geospatial data, how does climate and population interact as we um, look at the work we do together and, and how do we think about mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the ways that census data can help guide us as we're you know, becoming um, acutely aware of the climate impacts on our health work. Yeah, it's uh, absolutely critical that we bring together uh, the notion of the impact of climate on our global society how it impacts individual countries and where they happen to be geographically, uh, and the exposures they have to different natural disasters or other things like you know sea levels rising. Um, so uh, that's incredibly important. And what it means in terms of where we go in our relationship and how we can better serve uh, the countries that you prioritize is this notion of bringing those two things together uh, with different data products. It starts with geospatial data and then aligning and gathering and aligning demographic data uh, with those geospatial datas. Then secondly, overlaying that, sort of like a little layering you know, on, a, on, a, on a mapping uh, uh, place, um, the, uh, the threats uh, and the opportunities associated with uh, climate, the topology, the geography, etc. Now we have a product called in the U.S. called uh, Community Resilience Estimates, and it it basically is a, a data visualization that uh, again starts with geospatial data, loads on uh, different demographics, and then adds on things like wildfires, floodplains. Uh, areas that are susceptible to hurricanes and other national, uh, natural disasters. Uh, and then it can be used by calculating risk factors for different, for the population based on the rich socioeconomic data we have. Um, it identifies the communities and even the neighborhoods this, at the census tract level of folks who are most vulnerable if a natural disaster like a flood occurs. There, are, there could be a neighboring uh, area that is not as vulnerable because they have access to their own vehicle, whereas this other one has you know, nursing homes and they rely on public transportation and things of that sort, things that are affected by natural disasters. That is direct application on a global scale, and we're looking to see if we can take those ideas and that approach to easy data visualization, pulling together uh, both uh, economic and uh, climate and other types of data layering uh, to, to create those types of tools so that other countries can, uh, can have, you know, develop better public health plans, disaster plans, you know, where to go for relief efforts and things of that sort. 
that makes me want to pivot slightly before I come back to the future of, of data. You know, there's such a tight relationship between our vital statistics functions, our civil re registration functions, and our census functions. What is the relationship in the census in that work? Do you help also on civil registration or vital statistics? Or they sit in another part of uh, well, we don't we don't help in it, uh, but we rely on it. Okay. Uh, so we have uh, things like uh, if if you're uh, a U.S. citizen and you turn 65, you're supposed by the time you turn 65, you're supposed to get get on Medicare. I know that because I'm. Above 65, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know when you're born, you get a social security number. There's the numidate file. There are different administrative files that are associated with civil registrations, uh, and that's really really important. There's also vital records that we rely on. Vital records are critical for us to be able to take uh, a decennial census in a year zero as a starting point, and then mature it in year one with by taking out deaths, adding births, looking at migrations between counties and things of that sort, and then maturing it again and maturing it again. Um, so it's vital records are essential to having a good statistical office and providing the data that the a country needs in order to uh, do all kinds of uh, policy and uh, policy work. So then go to, to go back to the future of the census, mm -hmm. um, it's been a 70-year partnership. And on one basic level, the census is ancient, mm -hmm. right? And the basic principles and function of it has been with us for, um, uh, it seems, you know, centuries. Um, but do you see, do you have a sense of, you know, in the next 70 years, where are potential directions of the evolution of um, census work? Yeah, uh, the, the evolution comes to me comes in three flavors. Uh, one is the leveraging of technology uh, to make it easier to do censuses. The second is the type of information that's gathered and then how it's pegged geospatially. And then the third is more, to me, cultural relevance. I mean, there are still peoples across the world that are uh, semi-nomadic. And so what does that mean in a census, and where do you place them geographically, and things of that sort. So there, there's a cultural component that people, we don't always talk about, that's really relevant. Uh, the example I like to give is uh, we do surveys, um, you know, national surveys, which means everybody, right? So we'll send uh, our interviewers out to uh, a, a rural village in Alaska and then proceed to ask them questions about, you know, what's your monthly income? Well, they sus they're on sustenance living. It doesn't make any sense. So it would be nice to be able to collect data that are culturally re relevant to the particular populations, recognizing the need to gather common data for everybody for economic purposes or, you know, Broader, broader types of things, but we also need to remember the cultural relevance of individual communities and peoples as well. Let's unpack all three a little bit, one, one mm -hmm. layer deeper. So technology, where's the technology evolving and um, uh, for making it easier to capture census data? I'm partly, Hans Rosling is a hero of many people mm -hmm. in health, the demographer, founder of Our, our World in Data. His son has, a Maybe son, maybe, maybe daughter, had, has this amazing website um, that they've built where people um, take photos of their home, of their bathroom, of their, you know, understand their living environment, a sort of structured way that you get to see, you know, where do you toilet, where do you shower, where, what, what's your sleeping situation, et cetera, um, as a way of capturing really demographic very rich demographic census information. I don't know if it's quite census information, but um, uh, I can also imagine that civil libertarians might find it scary to capture <laughs> richer information. How does technology, how could technology make it easier to capture information and, and have richer information? Well, uh, first of all, we, we should recognize and that the US, and I believe this is true globally, is becoming more richly and beautifully diverse, which means a different mix of culture and languages 
and how people, the concepts that people have about what does it mean to live here? What does it mean to have family, you know, uh, and, and things of that sort. So it's really important to be able to leverage technology um, to gather, uh, to ask or solicit information in a way that's culturally relevant and understandable. And I see way in the future, <laughs> I hope, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a prognosticator type of thing, but I do see in the future being able to enable artificial intelligence to, um, to have an individual have an exchange with technology. It, 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 it could be a computer or, or a, on a cell phone so that they're receiving questions in a way that's relevant, culturally relevant to them and providing answers that, uh, that are not only uh, relevant from their perspective but are relevant from a sort of a standardized database that can be used across countries as well as within, cross-culturally, uh, that type of thing. So that's one area. The other area is making life simpler in terms of data collection. Um, you know, being able to do things on a cell smartphone. We're already there and we've already leveraged some of that technology with some of our relationships with countries uh, through the USAID and census uh, partnership. Uh, but taking that to the next level would be uh, very useful. And then getting it to a point where you don't have to have a nominal l level of um, sort of liter literacy so that the, you know, I, I liken it to sort of the, uh, the emergency rules on an airplane, you know, where you, it's just pictures. If we can find a way to transform through technology the, the ability to solicit and gain information in that fashion, and I, I think we're, we are close to that <laughs> if, if we're not already there, that that could be really useful in gathering more accurate information that we're gather than we're gathering right now. I'm getting the signal that it's time for questions and answers. So um, uh, let's let people in. to jump in with questions that you might have. How are we doing it so that they can be captured? Do we have a microphone? We do. And uh, first of all, maybe round of applause for our speakers. Thank you so much. Um, we, we have an online question that's come in already. Please keep them coming. Maybe then we can alternate back to the room. So have your questions. And we have Kate, who's going to um, act as runner. This is a question for both of you. Would it be too big of a statement, or would you agree with the fact that data saves lives? Um, OK, I'll be, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be a little on the edge here. I do not think data saves lives. I think people save lives. I think what people do with data saves lives. And that really matters, because there have been, you know, like I said, over my career, being the sole Latino in a room full of uh, uh, decision makers, I've often found that we can look at exactly the same data and come up with exactly opposite conclusions. <laughs> and uh, you really have to understand that it's the people who use the data that are going to save the people's lives. You absolutely need the data, but uh, I'm, I'm really focused on people and making sure that they use it well. But what do you think? But the, la the last thing you said is what's my modification. Data is essential to saving lives, yeah. is what I'd say. Um, I know this from my medical career, mm -hmm. that the things you think you know and that you think you see every day, until you've actually uh, examined it with evidence and um, uh, careful statistical techniques <laughs> um, uh, and, and appropriate comparisons, you don't really know what progress you're making. Um, the USAID and global health in particular are extremely data-driven. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, even here, we are often reluctant to, you know, another 1% of budget could go towards buying that many more vaccines or that many much more uh, uh, training. Um, and so we can be reluctant to invest in the data. Mm -hmm. Some of our programs have a much stronger data imperative and expectation than others. But I think we've all really learned that those programs that have invested a lot in data have accelerated impact 
have been able to drive um, uh, much, uh, that it's driving, saving lives or improving lives much more significantly. And then it helps us also make the case for the uh, impact that we're having so that in the competition for always limited resources, resources are never unlimited, then um, uh, we are uh, allocating appropriately to the things that save the most lives. So it's, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, I would, couldn't agree more. Data does not save lives, people save lives, but data is essential to getting there. Yeah, and uh, actually here's a, here's a corollary that um, data is essential, but you have to understand its strengths and limitations because no data are perfect. Uh, I've gone around saying, because it's absolutely true, no census in the history of the United States has ever been perfect. No census in the history of any country over the course of history has ever been perfect. It needs to be really good or good enough for the purpose that it's intended. And uh, that's, that applies too to medical data as well. It's not perfect, but it, it's often, but it needs to be of sufficient quality so that you can make the right decision. Microphone to somebody. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, good morning. And uh, my name is Corey Wernell. And Dr. Santos, as an anthropologist, you talking about cultural relevancy makes my heart sing. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> as a statistician, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in 2009, I was actually a numerator going into the 2010 Thank census. you for your service. <laughs> sure. And I realized how much that is based off of addresses. And so I'm wondering here in the United States what the um, connection is with the annual January count of those who are unhoused and more relevant to our work with USAID. Do we see that in other countries and, and how those can go together because often in public health, those are the people who need the help the most. Uh, well, th yeah, thank you for the, the question. The, the annual count every January is something that's conducted by the Housing and Urban Development Department. And it's really essential because it is something that, that uh, addresses the fluctuations that can occur over time in unhoused, unhoused people, recognizing that being homeless is not a, uh, a dichotomy, uh, a, a permanent sort of like you're either you know, uh, homeless or not. It can, there, it's episodic. Uh, there's all kinds of complexities associated with it. So it's really important to capture that with these annual things. In the decennial censuses, it's critical to have a period of time. You know, usually we have a, a census day where we send out individuals to go out uh, to areas that, uh, that typically uh, have uh, groups of, of homeless folks staying like under bridges and tents and such so that we can do similar counts. It's a necessary and important part of any type of data collection. Hi, thank you. James Maloney from the Office of HIV AIDS, uh, and lucky to have worked with uh, Census Bureau as part of the PEPFAR, uh, one of the implementing agencies there, but also uh, when I was posted to Haiti, um, we worked with Census and NASA actually uh, to get some aerial imagery and satellite imagery and some ad advisors from Census to help us um, address some humanitarian uh, crisis. Um, one of our rate limiting steps at the time there was just ability to process that imagery to guide some of the decisions. And I'm curious, um, you know, you mentioned the gaps now between census and many of the countries we work. Uh, we need that information and often at not just the national level but subnational level to guide our programming. What, what do you see and, and what's the promise and what's census doing uh, with the advent of AI to help um, uh, use some of that sharper satellite imagery to guide our, our estimates in between those years in which we get a census? And is that something that we can look to in the future to, to kind of sharpen estimates there? Yeah, the, the quick answer is absolutely yes. <laughs> uh, we, uh, are, we have done a lot of work uh, in, our, uh, in our geography division to leverage satellite images 
machine learning and and maybe a little bit of AI mixed in to to be able to take a look at uh, temporal you know images uh, of satellites of different areas to detect new construction to identify potential housing units that do not have strict addresses associated with them like on tribal lands or other other types of areas and these have direct application to other countries especially countries that don't have necessarily the resources to send enumerators and people canvassers to go out and look and you know get the the geo coordinates it can all be done by satellite because of our coverage satellite coverage and the and the granularity now that's available but you also need that machine learning those algorithms and we're making a lot of progress on that and uh, may be able to comment more on that uh, in the near future. <laughs> One more. Hi, uh, Nida Parks, USAID, um, and was part of our COVID response team. Um, so COVID is another one where we were really dying for denominators, both to understand the at-risk populations who are being infected, of course here, but also globally, and then how to guide our intervention. So when you're the push to vaccinate everybody, we needed to understand who are the elderly, who are the at risk, who are the immunocompromised. So some countries had better data than others, but the question back to you all is, do you, in the last three years, did you have lessons learned um, in your work globally or domestically vis-a-vis -vis COVID um, and how you understood that, how you used census data to help formulate a public health response to the extent that you did any kind of bright spots, lessons learned that you could share with us um, and maybe something that might inform your work going forward? Do you want to answer that first? And then oh, I, 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 I'm just curious, <laughs> curious as she is. <laughs> this, was, this was incredibly hard because, um, you know, WHO set a standard of a 70% vaccination rate, but it didn't make sense because you had countries where 50% of the population was under 18. And what we really needed to do was make sure we were getting 90% of the at-risk population. But finding the at-risk populations or even knowing the dimensions, how many vaccines do we order, how many, you know, what, where will we find people, um, uh, there were many, many issues. So under, I'd love to hear from your perspective what you lessons you learned from COVID. Yeah, we, uh, there were actually a ton of, of lessons learned that I'll describe in a second, they don't necessarily point to a specific new data set or capability as much as a recognition that the pandemic changed the world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, it, and it came literally the weeks, one or two weeks before census day. So all of the plans that we had uh, generated, uh, operational plans uh, had to, uh, uh, a large portion had to be rethought. What are we going to do now that we need to stop, wait a few weeks, and then start deploying? Uh, what does it mean in terms of um, if we do deploy, you know, what type of, of protection should our enumerators have for those folks who don't respond? Even more complex is it changed society. If, if you recall, as soon as we shut down uh, society in the U.S. anyway, there was a uh, amalgamation of households. We suddenly, uh, you know, the parents went out and got their parents, and you had three generational households. Um, folks in cities who were privileged enough to have sort of outs, you know, outskirts uh, summer homes or whatever, they went out there to hunker down and stay away from potential uh, uh, increased risks of exposure and things of that sort. Um, the communities, uh, stakeholders that we organized around the country, they had strategies like, let's put a table, you know, in a grocery store and say, come to your census and, you know, we'll help you fill out a form. We couldn't do that. So they had to rethink. But it was, it was interesting. It's, you know, I liken it to, um, uh, I had a, a little ponytail plant uh, that we've had now for 50 years. <laughs> And there was one, one winter in Texas where it, it froze and the top came off and we thought we killed it. The same thing with, with, uh, with the pandemic. Everything stopped in its tracks. But over time, little shoots came out and it became this beautiful thing with branches. 
the innovation that came as a result of this tragic pandemic in our census staff and in society, in the community stakeholders and the creative ways that they used to message out that blossomed. And we ended up uh, being successful only through this joint partnership. Our lessons learned then had to do with recognizing that we can preserve scientific rigor and change uh, to accommodate these unknown you know, threats. Uh, we actually completed the census before there was a vaccine available. And we did it by magically coming up with a million masks that we could use to deploy to, uh, to our enumerators. Uh, we worked and found value, such value, with uh, community-based organizations that we've continued that relationship. We're no longer waiting till year seven to say, hey guys, there's gonna be a census, and then in year zero saying, you know, see you later type of thing. It's continuous because now we can sell the value proposition of the data, create and instill trusted ecosystems of mess trusted messengers. Uh, so we're realizing these really valuable lessons about how to collect and maintain an infrastructure that includes people uh, as part of our, our system to generate data. Of course, in a decennial census, it makes sense that 2020 would have been the, a, a particularly difficult year, but it did not occur to me what you must have had to go through. It was And incredible. amazing yeah. that you actually did complete the census, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I'm sure we've had the similar challenges with our partner countries. We're at this last question. No, oh, it's time. It's, it's actually, time. Oh. It's time. Time we flies had our when you're having session. fun. Um, thank you both for your time and for your thought-provoking um, discussion. With that, unfortunately, we're at the end of time, but I hope you keep the conversation going. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank, thank, you. thank you for thank you so much.